good afternoon. Good afternoon. Everybody asleep? It's mid afternoon. You have a day. Anybody else have the meatless meatball sandwich like I did? I mean, that's actually pretty good. I had no idea what I ate, but it was actually good. Oh, what an amazing day! Can you hear the door badges? Just sitting here absorbing all this information and getting completely recharged. You're ready to go back out there and fly the things we're learning. How about you? Are you ready to take some of what you've learned today and put it into action? <laughs> the reason we come together for events like this is because how many of you have discovered this is a tough fight? Yeah. It's a tough fight. It beats us down. 17 years ago, in 2001, I quit the pro-life movement. I had gotten involved in the movement when Planned Parenthood opened an abortion clinic in the town I used to live in, College Station, Texas. My wife had dragged me into getting involved, but I realized children are going to die here, women are going to be wounded here, I've got to do something. And so I started volunteering with the local group that was formed to try to respond to this crisis, the Coalition for Life. And we got more and more involved bit by bit. The abortion facility regrettably opened, so we shifted from trying to prevent it from opening to trying to close it down. But everything we did didn't seem to make a difference. The abortion numbers kept going up. I left a lot of the volunteer work and took a step up into leading on the board of directors of this organization. I was the least qualified person to be on the board of directors of a pro-life organization that nobody else would say yes and they needed to fill a spot. And for two and a half years, I and the people in that community tried everything we knew as more children died, as more women were wounded. And people got tired, people got frustrated, and lots of people were quitting. And I finally decided, you know what, I'm done with this. Why don't I go do something where people actually like me for doing it? Why don't I go do something that's not as controversial? Why don't I do something that's more in my comfort zone? I'm naturally an introverted person. Why don't I just do something different? And so I told the board of directors, my time is up, I'm off the board, I'm done. So we had our fundraising banquet for that little organization. It was our lowest turnout we had ever had. In the three years since that group was formed, we raised less money than we raised before. And the announcement stage, David is moving on to go do some other things. Let's thank him for his service on the board. All three people clapped. I was relieved. And then the keynote speaker that evening got up to talk. His name was Joe Scheidler. Joe Scheidler, many view as the godfather of the pro-life movement. But that night, Joe laid out a case about this being the greatest human rights crisis of our time. And he laid out the importance of all of us being involved. And here I was, ready to quit. And I started to feel the fire lit again. And then he started to fan the flames. And as he shared his message, it just really started to become a conviction that I wasn't supposed to quit. I needed to stay engaged. And at the end of his talk, Joe Scheidler called out to the audience of people assembled there. And he said, I believe there is one person here in this room who is supposed to go full time in the pro-life movement to take what we've been talking about tonight and put it into action. He was talking to me that night. Two weeks from that day, I quit my job in the pharmaceutical industry and I dove in working full-time in the pro-life movement. Going from quitting, because I was so disheartened about the discouragement, the challenges, to jumping in and leading a little local pro-life organization. Had it not been for one person at one event that said one sentence to me, I would have never been at that organization. My guess is that organization would have continued to go downhill and fold because the leader had just stepped away from it. And had that one person, Joe Shiler, not extended that invitation and that message to me that night at that event, I would never have hired the little staff we had at that group. We would never have sat around a wooden table where we had an hour of prayer that birthed 40 Days for Life. 
because of one event, one person, one message. And today, three quarters of a million people have participated in 40 Days for Life. Today, 14,643 lives have been saved. Today, 177 workers, including Abby Johnson, have left the abortion industry. Today, 96 abortion centers are closed because of an event like this and because one person said one thing that made all the difference to me. Hallelujah. Now, I was not planning to share this story this, this afternoon. But over lunch, I was talking with Destiny, and we were both talking about, yeah, what are we going to talk about during our talks this afternoon? And I was sharing this story, and I said, you know what's really interesting? I said, years later, there was a roast in Chicago for Joe Scheibel. And I was invited along with a lot of other national pro-life leaders to come in and all give these tributes to this man who's had a profound impact on the pro-life movement. And so I was the first one that night that got up to give a little short two or three minute roast for Joe. And I shared that story. I said, because of this man, he came, I was ready to quit because of what he said. I'm in the movement and look at what God has done through that. The person who got up after me said, that's interesting. I was in an event, Joe Scheiber said the same thing, and that's why I'm here. And then the next person, and the next person, and the next person. And almost every person that was there that night as a leader of a national effort, someone who had impacted tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of lives, it was because of that one man at one event they had been at inviting them. I was beginning to think, does he say that everywhere? Joe gets up at the end and says, yes, I say that everywhere. <laughs> but you know what? Here's the good news. There is in this room at least one person that if you take the messages you've learned from this conference and you go and put it into action, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of lives could be spared because of you. And one day when we're all back together and abortion is a thing of the past, when abortion is history, we're going to be sharing stories and saying, I thought it was me he was talking to. No, I thought it was me he was talking to. I thought it was me. And it doesn't matter. Because each of us have a role for such a time as this. Amen? Amen. So, with that, we're going to talk about how to accelerate the end of abortion. And you say, David, we're here in California. Don't you know we are nowhere near the end of abortion? How are you going to accelerate this? We're going to unpack this a little bit. I'm going to start with an example. When I was in high school, I heard that there was going to be a news interview talking to at that point, the wealthiest man in the world. He was a Japanese multi-billionaire, and they were going to interview him about how he made his fortune. I thought, this could be interesting to learn. So I tuned in for the interview. And at the beginning of the interview, the interviewer said, Mr. So-and-so, we're going to talk to you about how you made your fortune in business. He said, what did you do? What were your strategies? What were your tactics? And the guy said, well, you know, it was pretty simple, actually. When I was a little child, I found out that if I saw a problem and I offered somebody a solution to that problem, they would reward me for solving their problem. He said, as I got a little bit older, I looked for a little bit bigger problems. It took a little more work to come up with a little bit bigger solution, but then there was a bigger reward. He said, the way I made my fortune and became the wealthiest man in the world is I just spent my life looking for bigger and bigger problems, coming up with bigger and bigger solutions, and getting bigger and bigger rewards. That's it. And I was a bit disappointed thinking that's your whole message. But then the profound meaning of that struck me. Because think about what we're gathered here today to take on. We are taking on the single biggest crisis in our culture today. There is no bigger problem. When we look at abortion today, the leading cause of death in the United States of America, we realize this is the defining crisis. History is going to measure you, it's going to measure me, by how we respond or fail to respond to our greatest crisis. This is the big problem. Since the Roe versus Wade and Doe versus Bolton decisions, not even counting when California decriminalized abortion earlier than that, just since that time, 60 million lives have been lost to this great injustice. As we sit here, as Walter and others talked about, every few minutes, children are dying, women are being wounded. So we need to make this time worthwhile so we can go back and do something with what we've learned to turn the tide. We look in here in California, and though your state doesn't report the abortion numbers, the Guttmacher Institute in 2014 said on average at that point, about 154,000 children a year 
who are losing their lives in California from abortion. So when you look at the entire national landscape, that means that one out of six abortions in America happens right here in California. This is the big crisis. Planned Parenthood, the leading perpetrator of abortion, 321,848 abortions last year alone while taking in $543.7 million of taxpayer funding. You and I are being forced to underwrite an organization to the tune of half a billion dollars a year that is systematically destroying our nation's future. Can you identify a bigger problem? That is our challenge. But if that is the big problem, just like that Japanese businessman said, then we need to work to find big solutions. And it's not going to be easy. And when we find those big solutions, there will be big rewards. Maybe not billions of dollars. Maybe not fame in the eyes of the world. But the satisfaction of knowing your community will be free of violence. Your community will be just. Your community will be loving and compassionate. And we will have a world that once again respects and protects the fundamental dignity of every human person. When you see those abortion facilities closing, when you see women who are no longer weeping, carrying the pain of abortions from years ago, that is the reward we get. And for those of us who are people of faith, we understand that one day there's even a better reward. When we go to heaven and we meet our maker and we hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. So we've got a big problem. We know we're working for big rewards. We have to focus on the big solution. And that's what we're going to talk about. So first off, let's assess where are we? Right now, where is the movement? How are we doing? Are we making progress? Well, the good news is we're making enormous progress. And in light of the challenges we're facing in the culture right now, it's really miraculous the pro-life movement has made so much progress. Think about this. In 1991, the abortion industry reached its pinnacle. That was the premium year. 2,186 abortion centers across America. Today, that number is 600. 600 two-thirds of abortion centers have shut their doors and gone out of business. During that same time, we've seen fewer and fewer physicians willing to violate the fundamental tenets of medicine, even though they don't use the Hippocratic Oath anymore, they are not willing to do abortions, and fewer and fewer providers are even willing to commit abortions, and at the same point, the abortion industry is shrinking, the pregnancy center movement is exploding. There are now more than 2,300 pregnancy help centers all across America offering hope, offering help, offering healing to those affected by abortion-related crises and unexpected pregnancies, and that number continues to grow. All we have to do is look at polling to see that right now, Pro-life people outnumber pro-choice, self-identifying people by at least a 12-point majority. And when you really drill down into those numbers, the two groups that are the most pro-life in our population right now, under age 30, giving us great hope for the next few decades, that's our future, and women. Women are more pro-life in America than men are right now. <laughs> Record participation across the United States in pro-life efforts. New efforts springing up, some of which we've heard from today, some of which are being presented, and you've got opportunity to go out to the tables. There's new efforts springing up everywhere. On the legislative front, I know we all get frustrated. Here in California, you get enormously frustrated with the legislative situation. But even as we get frustrated with what happens in Washington, D.C., and we say not enough is happening there, a lot of people say, well, forget Washington. We're going to work and do good in our own communities, in our states. 338 pro-life laws have been passed in the last seven years, which is more than the previous 30 years before that combined. So we're making progress. We're making progress. So I want you to think about all the good that is happening. And even here in California, you could say, David, yeah, that's great. That's happening everywhere else. Do you not know what it's like here? But there are lots of good things happening. Today, the abortion rate in California is less than half of what it was in 1991. The abortion rate is cut in half. That's amazing. And in the midst of that, you've got some of the most amazing networks of pregnancy centers. And you have two of the three largest pro-life events in the entire country in the Walk for Life West Coast and One Life LA. And you have the most 40 Days for Life campaigns of any state in the union. California, even in the midst of your challenges, you are making enormous progress. But I want to add a cautionary note here. We cannot get complacent particularly in light of what's happening 
just this past week in the Senate office buildings in Washington, D.C. As we watch the confirmation hearings of Brett Kavanaugh unfold before our eyes, there's a risk of complacency. Because a lot of pro-lifers think, yep, he'll get, he'll get appointed to the court, and then Roe is a matter of history, and then it's all over. Abortion ends. Woohoo! Job done. That's not the case. That is not the case. First off, when Roe is overturned, all that does is send it back to the states. Not one thing would change in California the day after Roe is overturned. And that's when. That's a long road still ahead of us. It's likely that it will still be some time before that challenge happens at the US Supreme Court. And are we as a movement equipped, ready, and prepared to battle this out state by state against the abortion industry? My perspective, having been numerous times to all 50 states, is we're nowhere near ready. We're nowhere near ready. And I want to do a reality check. I could give you a big raw raw, everything's going great talk, and there are a lot of things going well, but the reality is we've got some real serious challenges that we have to face. Head on. So we're not ready for Roe, even if and when it's overturned. Not only that, the abortion industry is more galvanized now than they have been any time in recent decades because of what's happening at the U.S. Supreme Court. They have been able to fan those flames, and you've probably seen that happening around you in your communities, in the media. They are galvanizing people. They're galvanizing money. They are getting people whipped up into a frenzy. Planned Parenthood announced in the news just a few weeks ago they are doing a massive expansion, opening new facilities, and they're not just going to the easy places for them like California where they just smooth sailing. They're going straight to where it's tough, to where the world would say, oh no, you'll never be able to succeed there. They're going into red states, southern states. They are going in this for the long haul because they're committed to press their agenda forward. And just this past week, I don't know if you saw it, Lila Rose's group, Live Action, broke the story about a 92-page report that the abortion industry put together. It's called the Reproductive Health Investors Alliance Investment Case. I encourage you to read this entire thing. Essentially what the abortion industry did is they got all of their top thought leaders, all of their big influencers in the educational system, all of the major organizations, Planned Parenthood and Around Now, all of them together, and they came and said, we have to map out a strategy based on the realities of the landscape today and where it's expected to go. And they spent months preparing this. They did detailed analysis. They went through the landscape and all of the different players and all the different financial factors. And they went through every single state in the union and did deep analysis on everything. And then they mapped out their battle plan to accomplish their two goals. And they were totally upfront about it. On page 10 of this report, they're very transparent about what it is they are trying to do. The entire outcome is to increase the supply of and demand for abortion. This report was prepared to take to billionaire philanthropists and mega foundations with the intent of raising hundreds of millions or perhaps billions of dollars to channel into their efforts to expand the supply of abortions and the demand for, creating customers who then feel they need abortion. And I'll tell you, it's terrifying to read through this, the depth of analysis they have done. Why I'm telling you this, the abortion industry is taking this seriously. And they are in this for the long haul. And my question to us is where are we? Are we in this for the long haul? Are we as committed as the abortion industry is? And if not, what needs to change? Because if we have the biggest problem in our society, we know what we're aiming for, a culture free of this violence that loves, respects, and protects every human life, then we have to be very strategic and we have to be willing to think bigger and act bigger than anything we've done before to be able to combat that. Are we ready for it? Are we ready for it? That's what it's going to take. So here are some things I want to plant as seeds of thought for you as we address some of these challenges. First off, 
We have to be honest about the fact that we are fragmented. We are frequently siloed, and we as a movement frequently have all these different groups that do a lot of good things. But many times they barely even communicate. And that's why when Teresa told me about this event, I was like, I'm there. Because here's where the groups, the leaders are coming together to collaborate and strategize. If we approach this individually, one group this way, one group that way. I was talking to a friend this past weekend who is a Marine. And he said, David, can I just give you my perspective as an outsider of the pro-life movement and tell me if I'm seeing this right? He said, like, let me just use a military analogy. He said, if we were in a military conflict, in every division, you have the major branches of the military, and you have the divisions and all the different fronts of the battle. He said, if every division got up onto their little front and they had to do everything themselves, so they've got to come up with their strategy just based on what's in front of their eyes, They've got to, not only that, they've got to get their own supplies. Oh, we've got to go and we've got to get our food, we've got to get our uniforms, we've got to go recruit our soldiers. And then they've got to get the ammunition and bring it up there. And they're making all the decisions just based on what's in front of their nose. And they're not even talking to the next division at the next front, let alone air and, and sea. He said, do you understand that military endeavor would be a massive failure? He said, they're not coordinating. They're not strategically coordinated. He said, do you think that's a lot of where the pro life movement has historically been? And I said, you hit it, right on the head. So we can't look at what we do as an isolated activity. We can't even look at it as an isolated organization. We have to look at all of this as an entire movement and we have to realize that the stakes are so high right now that we can't just do what we've always done because if we do, we'll just keep getting what we've always got. And that's a little bit of progress, but in the time we're making a little bit of progress, a million more children lose their lives. A million more women are wounded. So we have to be willing to collaborate together and be strategic. This event was birthed from a previous event that started for that exact reason. To bring California leaders and groups together to say, let's determine a strategy for our state, and then let's map out the way to get there. And this event is an outgrowth of that. So you've got an incredible legacy, but I would make the case that work has only just begun. If we don't have our detailed analysis of the landscape, if we don't have our understanding of all the factors, all the players, all the different things going on, if we don't have that same level of strategy and thinking, if the goal of the abortion industry is to increase the supply of and demand for abortion, then all we need to do is flip the equation and say, how do we each find our place in driving down the supply of abortion, closing abortion centers, stripping away funding from Planned Parenthood and the abortion industry, taking away the support powers that hold up the abortion industry, and then how do we, different of us, bring down the demand side of the equation? Some of you are meant to have those conversations like Josh Palm and so many others have been talking about. Some of those conversations can be life-saving, life-changing. And that brings down the demand of those who think that abortion is their only option. Helping people in the church like Amy was talking about, that helps reduce the demand for abortion. And so we have to strategically look and say, where do I fit into this equation? Where is my part? Where is my role? Where is the effort that I can be a part of? Because this is our moment to up our game. This is not a moment for complacency. This is not a moment for us to just coast. We have to take this seriously. Because children are dying. Women are being wounded. Now this even applies, I'm gonna push some people out of their comfort zone here for a moment. This even applies to good things that people are already doing. So you may have heard that after spending a decade leading 40 Days for Life, I stepped away a little over a year ago from the organization. And the reason why was, well, a couple reasons. Number one, because I felt that, kind of like Jesus calling Peter out of the boat on the Sea of Galilee, I felt that Jesus was saying, come out of the boat. You got something more you're supposed to do. I had invested what I had to give to 40 days to build it to a certain point, And then I felt like God was asking me to do something more. And I was looking at a lot of the other factors in our culture. I was looking at the other parts of the movement and saying, we can't just be complacent even in doing really good stuff that we're doing. We have to think bigger. We have to act bigger than we've been acting. 
And so I stepped away to have a season to pray, but I was proactive in going out and looking at every facet of the movement, the width, the depth of the movement, working with different organizations, working with different facets, working with different efforts that are around and outside of what we traditionally think of with the pro-life movement, to just say, how can we address this problem even more effectively? How can we be more strategic? And it was terrifying for me. I had gotten to a point after 10 years, I was in a comfort zone. I knew the 40 days world, I knew all the wonderful 40 days participants and leaders, I loved it. But I also realized the seriousness of what we are facing demands more of all of us. And so I'm asking you to think about what that looks like for you. It may not be to quit what you're doing and step away from it. It may be to start something. It may be to take your efforts up to a whole new level. It may be to get more strategic about what you're already doing so you can see more results with it. I don't know what that looks like. But I think if you really apply your heart, your mind, your prayers to it, I think the path will become evident to you of what you are supposed to do. So find that next step for you. For me, one of the things that I'm going to be doing is I'm launching a project with a whole lot of national groups, state groups, and local groups where we're going to strategically focus on the states because that's the biggest weak link right now in the pro-life movement is the state coordination and organizing. And honestly, what I've seen here in California is part of the inspiration of why I felt that was a piece that needed to be addressed more effectively. Why the states, why is this so important right now? Well, number one, because that's where it's going after Rose overturned. Number two is that's where the cases are going to come from. They're going to go up to the Supreme Court to even eventually challenge Roe. It's the place where you and I can make the greatest life-saving difference right now. We don't have to wait for the Supreme Court to be perfectly aligned. We can make the greatest life-saving difference now. And not only that, it's the place where we have the greatest opportunity to be able to look at the lay of the land, make a plan, execute a plan, and see the results. Did you know that right now in America, there are eight states that only have one remaining open abortion center, and three of those states probably are less than a year away if the proper pressure is applied from seeing those places close. Can you imagine what that will be like when that first domino falls? Right. It's going to happen. We have to do it and we have to work for it. Not California, we got hundreds of abortion centers. You're right, your strategy is going to be different. But actually, it's even more important because you are the bellwether state for the rest of the union. What happens here spreads throughout America and influences the entire world. So don't rest on your world. Don't get complacent. I was last night in an event in Austin, Texas, and I was sitting at dinner next to Dan Patrick, who's the lieutenant governor of Texas. And when he got up to give his talk, Dan Patrick's whole pitch that night. They were fundraising for a, a pro-life, pro-family group. His whole talk is, we don't want Texas to become another California. That was all he had to say in the Texas world. Like, they're giving money left and right. But I was thinking, you know what? California don't want to be another Texas. California wants to be a better California. And you are the people that God is trying to be No pressure. No pressure. By the way, I've lost total track of time. How much do we have? So I'm over. Okay, so let's wrap this up. <laughs> Problem, solution, reward. That's where we started. You have the biggest problem in the biggest state of anyone. And as a result, don't think that coming up with a solution is going to be easy. Don't think that we can come here just for the day and walk out and have it all figured out. Get started, but then be willing to collaborate, be willing to be strategic, be willing to set your eye on the prize. Don't settle for anything less than moving towards driving down the supply, driving down the demand of abortion until it cannot be sustained in the state of California. You're the people who can do that. And when you do, when you do, you will see those facilities closing down. You will see joyful women thanking you for helping them in a time of need. You will meet the children who are alive because of your efforts, and you will see because of what happened in California, that momentum spreading throughout the rest of the country and around the world. What you do here does make a difference. And just as Joe Shiver said to me at that event many years ago, there's at least one person here that God has his finger on you, saying you're the one. You're the one who's supposed to start or grow or change something like no one else can. And my message to you is, 
Görüşürüz. Görüşürüz.